soundboard, uh, it's the guitar on, because I just have this weird feeling that it's not. Uh, there we go. Let's stay in order to blow this again.
sister-in-law complimented the tie when I went to go pick up the youngins. And uh, if you ever want to know why I could not care less about fashion, it is because of evenings like this. The cheapest tie I have ever personally bought in my entire life is the one y'all complimented on the most. So I think all this fashion stuff is made up and you've got about a 10% chance you're going to get something someone else is going to notice and like. So, there you go. Um, so, actually, I threw off my tie when I got home from this morning. I don't know where I've left it, so I'll find it some, somewhere. You know, you get home from church, you just, you, I, I got to take off the uh, noose around my neck. So, so, I had to change ties. So, all right. Most of my ties were given to me. When I decided to go into the ministry, I told my parents, never buy me a tie, because I know there's going to be a church somewhere who thinks that I lack ties. And that's largely been, been my story. So, all right, with that, uh, open your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1, uh, we are done with the book of Acts for the year. That doesn't mean you can't go back and read it. I recommend the book to you. Uh, but uh, we are working our way through the New Testament. We began in Acts. We now turn to Hebrews, and uh, you're supposed to be up through chapter 6. We actually started Hebrews last week, but we want to finish Acts. So we're in Hebrews, and we want to look at the first four verses of what I consider the most difficult book of the New Testament. Um, I know Revelation is, is, is complicated and, and has its own issues, but I, I find Hebrews um, a real challenge at times. But I'm always blessed whenever I take the time. To read it and to seek to understand it. Book of Hebrews, and with that, you'll stand with me out of reverence for, for God's holy word. The writer of Hebrews writes on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, beginning in verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as always, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears, our hands, our feet, our mouth, our entire being, uh, that we may submit ourselves to the Savior who is supreme. And may we see that you are superior to everyone and everything. May we lay down our idols. May we worship you in spirit and truth. May I decrease so that you can increase. In your son we pray. Amen. You may be seated. When you were a little kid, did you maybe hanging around the monkey bars? Did the words come out of your mouth that were, Oh yeah, my dad... Beat up your dad. Did you ever say anything like that? If not, you didn't have a very good childhood. I mean, let us be honest. I mean, that's the way we fought back in the day, right? It always started with that. Oh, yeah? Well, my dad can beat up your dad. 
right? And I didn't know anything about little Billy's dad, but I knew my dad could beat up his dad, right? My dad's 5'3", right? But I just believed that, you know, my dad, by definition, could take on anyone else's dad. And my kids have never said that. They usually say something like, oh, yeah, my dad can read more books than your dad, right? So something like that. It's, it, they're, they're not as confident in my throwing down abilities. But, um, but no doubt, growing up, we, we do go through the stage where we believe that our Fathers are superior, right? In strength and size and abilities and knowledge, right? Now that changes when you become a teenager and all of a sudden as young men we believe we're all of those things. And it isn't until we become a father we realize we, we know absolutely nothing, right? Our dad really could, we believe, beat up whoever else we may be dealing with their, their dad. Superiority is, is the word there. And, and another word we could use is supremacy. In this goofy case, it, it, it's our fathers, but maybe it's a different case for us. But, but just think about that. We Americans, even beyond the sort of goofy things we may say at the monkey bars when we were kids, but we Americans, we're known internationally for our arrogance. Let, let, let's be honest. We think we're the best. We think we're the top. We think we're this and that. This is why every four years at the Summer and Winter Olympics, if our guys don't win a gold medal, they didn't win nothing at all, right? I mean... I think it was the last Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics I was noticing, we weren't dominating in the medals the way I think we should always dominate. And that started making me a little nervous. What's going wrong, right? We, we've got to be supreme in, in all this sort of stuff. We believe as Americans we can beat any foe, conquer any nation, and overcome any challenge that we may face. If that involves landing on a moon, uh, bombing another country that may hurt our feelings, whatever it might be. We believe not only can my dad beat up your dad, but my country is better than any other country. But what about when it comes to Jesus? No doubt we would say on the one hand Jesus is supreme, or even Jesus is superior. But does our confession of that affect our affection? Does what we believe change how we live? The book of Hebrews at its core is an exploration of that very issue. Yes, it is a pastoral letter to a group of Jewish believers who are uh, struggling with their faith in light of suffering and personal uh, 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 suffering. But, but at its core, it is a book about the supremacy of Christ. Can I kind of show you sort of as an overview what, what, what is happening in the book of Hebrews? If, if you've already read through chapter 6, you, you've probably picked up on some of this, but it will continue throughout the rest of the book. So, for example, in, 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 in what follows after what, where we read, chapter 1 is dominated by the idea that Jesus is superior to the angels. In fact, you, you see that there in verse 4, and it goes all the way through. To which of the angels did God ever say X, Y, and Z. Jesus is superior to, to the angels. And I would say that the, the Jewish theology in the first century had a, had a uh, more robust angelology than perhaps what, what we may have today. Um, in chapter 3, that Jesus is superior to Moses. Yes, Moses did all these things, but Jesus is, as Moses predicted, a true and better Moses. Jesus is a true and better high priest. This actually shows up on two occasions, chapter 4 and then later in chapter 8, right? As the high priest enters the Holy of Holies, so too Jesus himself, as the great high priest, enters the Holy of Holies. He's a true and better Melchizedek. You remember that guy from, from Genesis? What a bizarre story that is. He just kind of pops up out of nowhere. And many of us, the theologians, scholars, uh, uh, whatever, when we read that, we're thinking, okay, that was weird. And then you read Hebrews, and, and it, it, you discover he's kind of an important guy, right? And, and what a mystery uh, he is. And the writer of Hebrews, chapter 7, makes a big deal about how Jesus is true and better than Melchizedek. Uh, he's, he's a superior than the temple itself. Remember, Jesus was so bold to say that this temple is going to come crashing down. But it'd be rebuilt in three days. He's a true and better temple. If the temple is where you went to meet God, Jesus, as God in flesh, is where we go to encounter him. He's a true and better sacrifice. If it takes a sacrifice to cover our sins, then Jesus is the true and better sacrifice. The sacrifices of the Old Testament have to be done at least on an annual basis. Jesus is an eternal <coughs> sacrifice. He's a true and better sacrifice. And this matters to us today, I believe. What we believe about Jesus shapes what we believe about life, where we find our identity, and the hope that we live by. Though Hebrews is a deeply 
theological book, and it is. It's one of the reasons why so many struggle with it. It is at its core a pastoral work. The writer presents Jesus as superior so that the readers might persevere in their suffering. Dealing with their crisis of faith, the writer of Hebrews says, look, here is Jesus. Here is everything and everyone else. You, you don't even put them on the same table as Jesus. He is alone. He is unique. He is superior to everything. So yes, you may be having a crisis of faith, and suffering may be intense for you right now with, with persecution. But you need to know that wherever you turn, wherever you go, you won't find anything better than what you already have. Though deeply theological, is intently pastoral. A weak Savior, he argues, will be of no help to you in your moment of crisis. This all begins here in the opening verses. You'll notice in, in Hebrews, the way it begins, there is no howdy duty, right? There's no greeting. All the other letters begins with Paul, an apostle, Lord Jesus Christ, you know, called by God, Timothy, our brother, Epaphroditus is a fun name, grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? And that's essentially it. Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the, to the diaspora, right? And this is all, right? You get a general greeting that is typical of Roman letters in the first century. The writer of Hebrews just hops right to it. He's almost like the apostle John in some of his letters. He doesn't begin with a greeting. He begins with, with theology. And so let, let us see what he says here in these first opening verses, because this is really going to set the tone for everything else you read in Hebrews. He begins with the point that Jesus is superior because he speaks. Notice what he says there in verse 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. I don't think it's any surprise for any of us to say that God is a God of revelation. God is a God who has revealed himself to his creation. If you've been with us on Wednesday nights, this isn't anything that, that, that is new. This goes all the way back to the story of creation, where God creates the entire universe, not with some sort of incantation, but rather by his words. God spoke, and behold, it was. We can even go beyond that. In Genesis chapter 3, we see that God is, it reveals himself to Adam, as he says in chapter 3, in the cool of the day. He spoke to Abraham in visions and visits. He spoke to Jacob in a dream. He spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend, Exodus 33, 11 tells us. And you see there in the opening verse, long ago, all these other generations prior to us, our uh, spiritual ancestors, God spoke to them in many ways. In many ways, but then he predominantly spoke to them by the means of the prophets. Yes, to Adam and Abraham and Moses, all that, there was those special kind of, of revelation. But the, he primarily speaks to us today, the writer of Hebrews says, by the words of the prophets. So even before we even talk about the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews says that if you wanted to get a word from God, don't go down to your basement, grab a yoga mat, cross your legs and hum. That's not what he says to do. He doesn't say look to the stars and check the local newspaper to see what the stars are telling you. No, what he says is that, that where you get the message of God is from the prophets, we would add the, the apostles, right? And that's what he says there. There were times when God gave special revelation in unique ways. But if you want to know what God says, you want to know what God is saying, you need to know what God said. And he points us back to the prophets. And this is very evident. In fact, the New Testament affirms this beyond the, uh, the writer of Hebrews. Peter said in 2 Peter, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. It's it's almost like he's writing to 21st century postmodern Americans, right? You read what Peter just said there. Look, look, proper interpretation doesn't come by you reading the text and asking yourself, self, what does this mean to me? What do I want it to mean to me? But it didn't come that way. He says, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the doctrine of inspiration, where we believe that the Bible is written by men, yes, everyday people like you and I, yet it is equally written by God. God uses the unique personalities in the context of the writers and the prophets and the apostles. At the same time, it is God who is speaking to us through 
those vessels of, 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 of inspiration. But now the writer of Hebrews tells us God has spoken in Christ. The prophets may point us to Jesus and that they gave us the word of God, but Jesus points us to himself because he is the word of God. What the writer of Hebrews does is compare the words of the prophets to the words of Jesus. Now let me just pause and say there that whether you're reading Joel, Jesus, or John, they are all equally inspired by God. Right? We don't have a hierarchy within the Bible. We don't pit Jesus against Paul. But with that said, you see that the, the writer of Hebrews is saying something here, that, that, that God's revelation was given to the prophets. But in Christ, God's revelation was given to us. He, was, he came in flesh. In fact, that's what John says. In John chapter 1, he says, And the word became flesh. Now that word, word, is an interesting one, isn't it? There's two words that can be translated word. One is the typical word for word. The other it carries some philosophical, theological uh, 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 baggage with it. John uses the, the latter. It's, it's logos. It's where we get the word logic. And, and, and in Greek idea, the, the, the logos uh, was, was a deep philosophical idea that kind of united all the gods. John says, no, no, you Greeks don't understand. It isn't that, that you're trying to unite all the gods. There's a hierarchy. I'm telling you that the Logos, the God, came in the person of Christ. He is both creator and redeemer. The word, the Logos, became flesh. And get this. He dwelt among us. He pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled among us. And we beheld the glory of this divine being. As the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. You see that this is unique in human history. Yes, the prophets spoke as they were given revelation. But here in the son, the words of God came in the form of the word of God. So now all this is to say that if you are in search of God, you will find him in Christ. If you desire to hear from God, you will hear him in Christ. Again, let us avoid efforts towards Eastern mysticism, religion, worldly philosophy, and charismatic means. If you want to know what God has to say, look to Jesus. Look to the Savior. This makes him unique in human history. In the classic uh, statement, uh, the, the writer is anonymous, but it's called the Incomparable Christ. It says, more than 1,900 years ago now, 2,000 years ago, there was a man born contrary to the laws of life. This man lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. He did not travel extensively. He possessed neither wealth nor influence. His relatives were inconspicuous and had neither trained nor formal education. In infancy, he startled a king. In childhood, he puzzled doctors. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature, walked upon the waves as pavement, and hushed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitudes without medicine and made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, and yet perhaps all the libraries of the world cannot hold the books that have been written about him. He never wrote a song, yet he has furnished the theme for more songs than all songwriters combined. He never found a college, but all the schools put together cannot boast of having as many students. He never marshaled an army, nor drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun, and yet no leader ever had more volunteers who have, under his orders, May more rebel stack arms to surrender without a shot fired. He never practiced psychiatry, yet he has healed more broken hearts than all the doctors far and near. Once each week, multitudes congregate at worshiping assemblies to pay homage and respect to him. The names of the past, proud statements of Greece and Rome have come and gone. The names of past scientists, philosophers, and theologians have come and gone. But the name of this man multiplies more and more. Though time has spread 1,900 years between the people of this generation, the mockers at his crucifixion, he still lives. His enemies could not destroy him, and the grave could not hold him. He stands forth upon the highest pinnacle of heavenly glory, proclaimed of God, acknowledged by angels, adored by saints, Feared by devils, devils as, as the risen personal Christ, our Lord and Savior. And again, he, in many ways past, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son. Let us just pause and consider the significance 
of a God who speaks in the form of his son. This means that revelation truly is intimacy. Have you ever noticed that the key signal of a relationship that is falling apart is the lack of communication? Can I just give you some marriage advice here? If you ain't talking, you ain't growing. You're falling apart, right? I mean, I, I think we all agree with you. You've been married for two or three minutes, and you get that, right? That's why they say that even if you're fighting, you've got a, you got a chance, right? It's the second you, you stop communicating. Now, when you're fighting, you're not communicating well, but at least there's an effort. But when you stop communicating at all, your relationship is falling apart. Why? Because we understand that communication is a form of intimacy. I, I, I don't just talk to just about anybody, right? If, if, if I go out to Kroger or Walmart and pick something up because my wife sent me out on a mission to get it, right? I have no intention to talk to people. I have no idea who they are, right? I may do the head thing, right? So, but that's about as far as I want to go with it. But I'm more than willing to have a long conversation with someone I love and I know because you can't really separate communication and intimacy. So too, what does it mean when we have a God who doesn't just speak from his throne, but he speaks from the roads and the hills and the lives that we live? God has come down and spoken to us in the person of his son. We encounter the word of God in Christ. And when we encounter the word in the word, that is the key to growing in intimacy with God. Let me show you secondly how Jesus is superior. He's superior because he sustains. Notice what he does at the end of verse 2 and on into verse 3. So he has spoken to us by his son. Notice this, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Through whom also he created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the power, by the word of his power. You see the emphasis on the word there, right? In these verses, we see a number of key theological doctrines intertwined. And just for the sake of simplicity and time, let's just look at them briefly. First of all, Jesus is Lord. He says, there whom he appointed the heir of all things. Now, heir does not mean he is lesser than God, but, but rather we see that he is equal with God. All that is God's is his. All that is the Father's is his, right? When he, he is risen from the dead and, and, and sent into the heaven, he is given all authority, we are told, among his last words. He is also creator. It says there clearly, through whom also he created the world. Jesus is divine. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Right? My son sometimes acts too much like me, but praise be to the Lord, he is not an exact imprint of me, right? I think we all understand that. In fact, we, we joke about that, but, but raising the kids, I look at them sometimes and I think my son is too much like my brother, right? And that scares me. And my daughter's too much like my sister. That frightens me. But then I'm reminded they're not exact imprints of my brother and sister. And that gives me great hope. <laughs> right? Great hope indeed. <clears throat> Our son said something the other day. And uh, as it came out of his mouth, I, I panicked. And I said, babe, he has turned into your father. I'm going to start calling him Alvin. And that is not a compliment. All right, we, we, need, we need to put a stop to this right, right now. But thank goodness he is not the exact imprint of my brother, me, or my father-in-law. But all of these four are related, right? As divine, Christ is creator. As divine, he's lord over his creation. As divine, he sustains his creation. Likewise, as creator, he's lord over his creation. He sustains creation. He's divine over his creation, right? All of these are intertwined. And the writer of Hebrews says, you find all of these embodied in Christ. So he wants you to see not only is it the, the above true, but that it is only true in Christ. Remember, his point isn't that Jesus is a really cool dude, right? And don't you want to be cool like Jesus? His point is, is that this is unique with Jesus. There's no one like Jesus. And wherever you may turn, you are turning to someone who is inferior to Jesus. Wherever you may go, you are going to where it is inferior to what you have in Christ. Can any of this be said of the prophets? Though they're used by God, they're not greater than Christ. Can any of this be said of the angels? Though messengers of God, they're not greater than Christ. Can any of this be said of the patriarchs? Though servants of God, they're not greater than Jesus. By the way, this is something we're learning the hard way as we become a post-Christian, secular, progressive society, isn't it? I've noticed that the more secular we become, the more religious we become. And whenever you become more religious, you become more moralistic. Have you noticed this? Any one of y'all woke yet? 
Hope not, right? And if you ain't woke, then you ain't pure in society's eyes, right? That's religious language, right? That you're a heretic, that you're outside uh, the, the bounds here. One of the things I've noticed is, is that the more woke we become, the more, str more we struggle with our past. Let me, let me share something that may offend you here. All of our great heroes of the past had flaws. Is that news to you? Shouldn't be. <laughs> okay, don't let it be. Everyone that we look up to that was a great giant of our nation or, or Western society or whatever it is, they all had flaws. But whenever you believe in, in, in woke righteousness, you look at the heroes of the past and you realize that if they weren't as woke as me, then they're lesser than me. Have you, have you noticed this trend? This is why statues are being uh, tear, torn down on, on college campuses. Roads are being renamed by people who aren't woke like we are. We've got to rename them after people who in 100 years later will discover we're flawed too. We've got to rename that road too. You notice this trend? I mean, in the last few years, it's come out publicly things we've known for decades. For example, uh, John F. Kennedy was an adulterer. Everyone has known that since the 1960s. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a racist. We've all known that since the early 20th century, but it seems like we just discovered this. Martin Luther King Jr. was a womanizer. I mean, one of the more ironic parts of history was, was JFK agreeing to, to do the Civil Rights Act with MLK in the Oval Office. And JFK has the audacity to say, uh, King, you need, to, you, need to, you need to be faithful to your wife. All the while, JFK himself was unfaithful to his wife, right? Because right, JFK didn't want to be caught up in, in all of this sort of stuff. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. All these people were imperfect. Some more severe than others, perhaps. But when you reject Christ, you are left with flawed icons. And when we now that we live in a woke world full of Pharisees, we are shocked to discover that they're not perfect like we think we are. The right of Hebrews says that he is supreme. As the Lord, as, as the heir of all things, he's the subject of our deepest affections. And out of that affection will come obedience. As the creator, he defines our identity. No longer do I need to look within or on social media or what the latest celebrity tells me I should be. But I know who I am, for he created me that way. As divine, that is the exact imprint of his nature, he becomes a superior sympathizer and a mediator. Flawless as divine, sympathetic as human. A sustainer who upholds the universe by the word of his power, he says. I know that I can be comforted that he holds me together even when the world falls apart around me. What is better? I know that as a loving sustainer, he will always hold me. See, there's no other savior like this. Can Muslims say this of Muhammad? Can Mormons say this of Joseph Smith? Can Eastern mystics say this of Buddha? Can materialists say this of Darwin? Can Republicans say this of Lincoln, Eisenhower, Reagan, or Trump? Can Democrats say this of Jefferson, Roosevelt, Kennedy, or Obama? The answer is no. There is truly no one like him. He is supreme. He is superior. Let me give you one more reason why Jesus is superior. He is superior because he saves. You see there at the rest of, of, of verse 3. He says that after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, have become as much superior as angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. You know, though there are, there, there are many pictures of salvation, and that may actually be a fun little series we could do sometime, the, the different pictures of salvation. The right of Hebrews emphasizes one of them more than the others from, from my reading. And that is the imagery of purity. The salvation is cleansing. Considering this, we should consider the staining effect of sin. And when we think about the staining effect of sin, we understand more deeply our real sense to be cleansed. Cleanliness is a major emphasis in Scripture. If you don't believe me, uh, read the Mosaic Law. Turn, turn to Leviticus, and you'll find that they were worried about cleanliness. If, this, if you touch this, you've got to go kill this animal and 
wash in this tub and wear this robe and so on and so forth, right? If, 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 if you do this or try that, you have this disease or, or touch that person with the disease, right? Or if, 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 whatever it might be. The, the, the process of cleanliness is, is a central ritual part of, of the Mosaic Law. So the Bible would frequently use words like filthy, dirty, defiled, unholy, and unclean to describe sin and disobedience. And that means that people can be defiled by their actions and their deeds and disobedience. Uh, uh, the, the nation of Israel can be defiled, right? Uh, they, they, they can be considered unclean. Uh, the land can be considered unclean. Homes can be considered unclean. And this stain effect comes not only from a guilty conscience, but also from being sinned against. And this is why I think this language is helpful, is that when we think of, of the stain of sin, it isn't just I've, I've, I'm unclean because of what I've done, but there's a sense of dirtiness because of also what has been done to me. Right? And we understand this, I think, uh, pretty practically, that, that, that one can have this sense of, of dirtiness, this sense that we've been violated, not just because of what we've done, but because of the sin that's been committed against us. So when we are lied to, when we are abused, assaulted, betrayed, and abandoned, there is that staining effect on our soul. There's a good chance, perhaps you or I, right now, something may have happened decades ago, yet there's still a part of us that feels stained. It feels defiled because of what someone did or what we may have, have done ourselves. And we understand, and that we may call it shame, we may call it guilt, we may call it dirtiness, we, we, may, we may call it a painful memory, whatever we may call it, it is that staining effect of sin and the sin, sinful world we live in that we live with. And so we feel unclean, we feel filthy, we feel unholy. And so what we often want to do is we try to purify ourselves. We try to cleanse ourselves to, to, to get out of this sort of stuff. And the Bible tells you that you can't do that. Uh, when I grew up, we, we read Chick Track. If you don't know what Chick Track is, move on with your life. Don't worry about it, okay? But I remember the first one I read didn't have words in it. It was just pictures, little comic book pictures that told the gospel. It started with Adam and Eve. And, and then it, it showed that when they sinned, they became like, uh, what's that kid from Charlie Brown that needs to take a bath? That's what they look like, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And they were dirty. And the next picture was of them in like a lake trying to wash off, but none of it was coming off. That was a biblical image. And in Jeremiah 2, it says, though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before you. See the language? You can bathe, you can wash, and you can sacrifice every lamb there is in Israel. But you would still be guilty before him. You see then that our deepest need as humans is to be <coughs> cleansed, is to be made pure. And what the writer of Hebrews tells us is that Jesus is what purifies us. This image of, of salvation by means of purification is, it runs rampant in, throughout the Bible. Let me give you a few examples. Isaiah chapter 6, right, is the call of Isaiah, right? You remember that, 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 that he, he sees the Shekinah glory of God. He sees the angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, right? Remember what Isaiah's uh, uh, comment was? This is going to be a bestseller, right? That's what he said, isn't it? I think so. I saw that on Twist of the Bible Nightly. I assume that's what he said. No, what did he say? He says, I am unclean, and I come from a people. Who are unclean, right? They've got unclean lips. And you remember what God does? An angel comes and takes a hot coal and purify him. He says, if this is what makes you unclean, you're now cleansed. Or one of my favorite passages all about, Zechariah 3. We, we've looked at it a few times before. It's the scene where Zechariah the prophet gets this vision of Joshua the high priest who, who represents Israel, but but but. We've talked about that before. But here's Joshua the high priest on the Day of Atonement in the presence of God, in the Holy of Holies. And he's covered in excrements. And there is Satan saying, oh, what a shameful person this is. This is the best you've got. This is your people. They are filthy. They are unclean. They are dirty. You remember, you remember what the angel of the Lord does? He tells his angels, look, look, remove the filthy garments. Give them a clean robe. 
Zechariah gets so excited in that passage, he says, oh, oh, don't forget the turban on his head. And the turban on his head would say, the high priest, it would say, holy unto the Lord. You see, in that scene, the angel of the Lord, who I believe is a pre-incarnate Jesus, cleanses the high priest. Not because of anything he's done, but because Christ is that good. Or what about the day of atonement? Remember, you got those two goats. One is the propitiatory goat. That is the, the, the goat of, uh, the, the, that atones the sins of the people. He, he dies in their place. Then there's the expiatory goat, the goat that, but that all the sins of the people are cast upon this goat. And he's sent into the wilderness. And the sins of the people go with him. He's never to be seen again. And the sins will be no more because it is gone. So to God not only, uh, uh, that Jesus not only appeases the wrath of God upon our sins, he cleanses us from all of our sins. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. That he, he makes purifications for our sins. And when he was done making that purification, he sat down, not because he's tired, but because he is done. You see why? Then Jesus is a true and better sacrifice. He's a true and better high priest. He's a true and better Moses. He is a true and better temple because you don't need another generation to replace him. You don't need another lamb to try it again, but rather he is done and his work is eternal. So he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high, superior to all of the angels. Who else can make this sort of claim? What idols do we worship could, could ever really save us? Will endless hours of entertainment free our mind from all of our worries? Will affirmation from anonymous likes online ever truly satisfy our souls? Will countless partners give us real joy? Will perfect marriage deliver peace? Will perfect growing family bring fulfillment? Will the respect to your peers bring you actually bring contentment? Will a robust career bring rest for your weary souls? No. Because none of them can purify your soul. How is it that the richer we become as a nation, the more depressed we become as a nation? Have you noticed this? How is it that with each technological advance, the more isolated we feel as a people? How is it that convenience has led to exhaustion? How is it that connection has led to loneliness? I think the writer of Hebrews has the answer here. Because there is one who is supreme. There is one who is superior. And to turn from him is to turn to one who is inferior of all things. So maybe what we need isn't more of the same. We don't need more power more politics, more prestige, more possessions, more promises. What we need is purification. That can only come through Christ. Is he not supreme? In his helpful book of essays, God in the Dock, if, if you like apologetics, you, you would probably like this book by C.S. Lewis called God in the Dock. And in the doc, he got on trial, essentially, is what he means by that. One of his essays, uh, Lewis, makes an interesting point. He says, what are we to make of Jesus Christ? I believe that's the title of the essay. This is a question which has, in a sense, a frantically comic side. For the real question is not, what will we make of Christ, but what is he to make of us? The picture of a fly sitting, deciding what is going to make of an elephant has comic elements about it. I think he's right. I think he's right. And that's where the writer of Hebrews is actually taking us, isn't it? When you consider Christ, don't ask, what are we to make of Christ? Ask instead, what does he make of us? Is Jesus supreme? I don't think there's any doubt of that. I mean, if you don't believe me, just keep reading the book of Hebrews. But what we make of Christ makes little difference to who Christ is. But what does he think of us? Well, that is a better, and maybe more likely a more frightening question, what we may want to consider. If Christ is supreme, what does he think of you today? 
What would he think of you tomorrow? What's your response going to be? Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would be so kind as to lead us to keep Jesus first. He is supreme. He is superior. He is unique and above all things. To turn from or to move away Christ is an inch towards something that is lesser than. May we not make that error. May we confess that Jesus is supreme. And being that that is the case, may we ask, not, do we think, well, not what do we think of Jesus, but what does he think of us? May we be found faithful. May we be found as his children. May we be found to be obedient in the kingdom of God. May you convict our hearts in this time of invitation. In the name of your glorious Son, we pray. Amen. Let's do this.
Thank you.